All right. Good morning, friends. Welcome to this episode of Gardening in the Gulf Coast. We're ha so happy to be bringing this program to you every month. Next month, we'll be uh, continuing the program on June the 6th, I believe. It'll be a Wednesday, whatever whatever day that is. It uh, We'll continue on the program with a uh, treat. We'll have another opportunity for our horticulture agents, all of our colleagues, to get together and provide a round table and answer any questions that you might have. So we'll ask you if you could please consider rejoining us again next month. Today, we'll be starting off a little bit of a review of fruit trees, and I wanted to include a, a little bit on that as well. This is, I'll be focusing on two fruiting type of trees, but I'll also discuss citrus. So a lot of the back end of this presentation will be focusing on citrus. Some of the information, if you've joined us in previous programs over the past year, will be familiar to you. But for those of you who this is a new new opportunity for you, of course, welcome to the uh, program, and we're so glad that you could join us. We are joined by uh, colleagues Kevin Gibbs, as well as Skip Richter. They'll be helping to facilitate, monitor the program for us. Remember, if you do have a camera on, we ask as a courtesy to us, as well as to all of our audience, if you could please turn your camera off, it would help to reduce the amount of bandwidth that needed to, to deliver this program to you. Also, thank you very much in advance for keeping your microphone off. There will be an opportunity to ask questions if you like. And of course, if you would like to ask a question, we ask that you place it in the chat function of Microsoft Teams. So I'm Stephen Brugerhoff. I'm the county, I'm the horticulturist for Galveston County AgriLife Extension. I've been here in the saddle since October of last year, and I'm having a grand time serving the community, serving our residents in Galveston County. Now, this program is a collaborative program, so we're sharing information across the Gulf Coast. We're covering information that is practical for our residents in Montgomery County, all the way down to Aransas County, around Corpus Christi, up and down the coast, we hope that uh, the information that we're providing to you will benefit you and your gardening practices. Now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service strives to provide practical how-to education programs that are based on research, on university research, to help your quality of life. And we do that through programs, through branded programs. Some may be familiar to you. If I say the word EarthKind, even though you may not know what the program means, it's a very friendly term that exemplifies or encompasses best practices in horticulture. EarthKind program has been around for several years, for decades now, and we know that uh, you will benefit quite a bit from learning through programs that we offer online through the branded EarthKind landscaping program. Another program that we've been marketing with extension is called Path to the Plate. We're using programs or the branding itself, Path to the Plate, to bring information of how food gets from the farm to your table. And I think we're each one of our uh, horticulture agents are doing a great job of that, as well as the volunteers that we had to dispense this information. Now let's get into the heart of the presentation. When we're talking about fruit trees or fruit culture, we are talking about location. And realistically, it is all about location. The image that you're seeing right now, it may be familiar to you, especially if you are living in and around Brazoria County or areas of Galveston County. This, this scene may be familiar to you. Very romantic view. Maybe you, you have the opportunity to own land. You've got a majestic oak, oak tree out in a pasture that sometimes has saturated soil, sometimes it doesn't. We've got beautiful Spanish moss hanging off the limbs, and, and that's just an outstanding experience for, for us. We all have to speak about where we're coming from. It helps us to identify ourselves when we're traveling the country or even to local folks. Where you're located gives us a sense of pride, and it's always good to bring that pride to the people that you meet on the street. Now, when we're gardening, we have to think a little bit differently about that. Certainly, we take pride in, I take pride in living in and around these counties for the past, gosh, 10 years. Uh, it's a pleasure to be out on the Gulf Coast. But when we're talking about gardening, we have to create a different, a different and unique place for those plants to survive and thrive. 
and orchards, of course, we're talking about developing an experience that is going to be, you know, clear of any kind of weeds, any, uh, we're trying to reduce pathogens, we're trying to pro provide an opportunity for the trees to thrive and survive. And that can involve keeping the area, if you've got an orchard or maybe you've got a single tree in, a, in your yard, trying to keep what we call the area underneath the tree clear of any other plants that might that might um, occupy that space that may use some of the resources that we're trying to provide to the trees. Our goal, of course, in gardening or fruit culture is the end product, which is the vegetable or the fruit itself. So those plants, the trees themselves, they need water, they need sunlight, and we're trying to prevent any other plants from encroaching on that or, or, or occupying that space. Now, what you're seeing here is a good example of commercial production. You've got these plants, they're spaced adequately apart in rows, maybe about 24 feet from row to row. On center, it really depends when you're planting that tree in that row. As far as spacing for those trees, we don't want them growing in together. We don't want those branches growing into each other that can cut down on airflow. It also can, um, it can also be a little bit challenging for you if you're trying to maintain those trees as well. And spacing really depends on the variety of tree that you're working with. Sometimes you can get away with 10 feet, 10 foot spacing. On average, I would say get at least 15 feet apart within a row of those trees so that you can work easily around those trees, either on the trees themselves or in the environment like mowing or mulching. So it, it really is about location. Here in Galveston County, we, ha the, we have the benefit of the beach. You know, when I say I work in Galveston County, I will have residents that I have not met yet that will say, oh, your office is on the island. And I have to tell them or inform them that yes, the island is part of our county, but our office is inland in a small town called Lamarck. Lamarck, Texas, right off of I-45 as you're traveling to the island. But because of where we're located on this good green earth, we do have challenges with our soil profile. This is a map that I borrowed from the U.S. Uh, I believe it's the U.S. Conservation Service. Um, it gives us an idea of the kind of soil types that we're looking at. Now, there are more distinct and detailed maps that are available through uh, national resources that will help you to identify what your soil uh, profile is like prior to buying property or if you're getting into production. Certainly you want to know that information, but this is just an overview of some of the challenges that we have here. And the major challenge that we have here are, are soils that are high in clay content that can get, um, that have the opportunity to get compacted if they're if you have a lot of traffic across, uh, even if you have a property out in the country, you can impact that soil profile, compact the soil by the activity that we apply to it. So this is a detailed map, but in general, I know that soil profile varies across the, across the county itself. Inland, of course, higher clay content, but as we get uh, closer to the coast, we have more sandy soils. This goes without saying. But I said it. So that in itself can provide challenges with for you, but as long as you understand what that is, you can modify your environment to successfully grow fruiting trees. Here's a here's another image of our county again, but with a um, an overlay to provide emphasis for our climate. So we know it all starts from the ground up. It is good for you, wherever you're located, to get to know what your so soil profile is like, because realistically, that's where it all starts from. You have to have you have to start from the ground up, and it's good to know what the soil profile is, so you'll know how to modify that environment. As far as the climate goes, we often refer to a document, a map that that has been generated by the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, and typically we'll we'll. It's called the USDA zone 
map or the USDA map, right? What it does is it provides us an idea of identified average lowest temperature that we can get in our area. In Galveston County, because we're a large, a large part of our county is inland, it can be very different than what you might expect as you get closer to the coast or even on the island. And depending on where you're at, where you're located, uh, dear viewer, you might experience the same thing. I was the county, I was the county agri-life horticulturist for Brazoria County for five years prior to, to uh, coming to Galveston County. And we had a similar, we had a similar zonal map that we were looking at. We existed in Brazoria County, we existed in zones 9A and 9B, a very small portion of Brazoria County is in 9B. In Galveston County, a larger portion is in 9A, but um, we're also dealing with areas that are in 9B. What that means is it's warmer inland and it's, it's warmer on the island and it, it gets a little bit colder uh, the further you get inland. Uh, I'm providing this information to you as an example for what you should investigate or what I'm asking you to investigate. So you may already know what USDA zone that you live in is, but here and in our surrounding area, I know exactly what I'm looking at. And that will play a large part in the kind of plants that you do choose to work with in your orchard or that you're trying to cultivate as a fruit tree. It's good to know how much rain you get here, because we're so close to the coast and we get those those wa those weather events uh, annually, we average about 50 inches of rain a year. So compare that with the average across the United States. We get a lot of rain, folks, <laughs> here in Galveston County, whether you're on the island or a little bit further inland. I believe Beaumont, if y'all know where Beaumont is, they get a lot more rain, a little bit more rain than than we do that will also dictate the kind of plants that you can work with successfully so you're combining all of these elements when we're talking about gardening now you, i know you know this but redundancy is my best teacher right so whether you're gardening with vegetables or in this case gardening with fruit trees you need to know what your soil profile is what what is the constituent of that soil it's good to know what your climate in your area is so you'll know how what kind of plants you can work with successfully in your in your property or or on your at your house we know we get quite a bit of rain here what that means is for certain types of plants we we have a higher incidence of fungal pathogens that um that our plants can be susceptible to here along the coast i think that's more important to pay attention to if you're uh, working with pecans we're not talking about pecans today but you get the idea we're in a higher human environment and of course, that is uh, lends itself to um, to a higher incidence of fungal pathogens here. But we can overcome that by knowing where we're at, and that will dictate to know what we're going to be planting. Now, let's talk about the planting environment. At this point of the year, it's already early May. May the fourth be with you. I I had to say that, folks. I just had to say it anyway. Um, your orchard is already established or the plants are already in the ground. If you have a fruit tree in a container, I would suggest to you to go ahead and hold off and planting that until uh, the uh, tail end of fall. Right, go ahead and just cultivate it in a container until you get to that point where you can put it in the ground. But if you're establishing a new planting, oftentimes that's going to be late winter or early, early, early spring. Um, you're going to provide it with this, the basic foundation of elements that each that these plants will thrive on. For fruiting trees, six to eight hours of sunlight plus. You're going to want to get them as much sun as you can for them to do as well as they can. You don't want to be dragging buckets or a hose across the yard. So make sure that you have a water source nearby. I also ask you to consider water quality. If you live uh, in areas that are close to, to the coast, you may have issues with water quality. And so it is a good idea to get a check on that to see what kind of water you're providing to that. If it's, it's very important if you're working with 
acid-loving plants like blueberries. Now, I won't be talking about blueberries today. I'm going to stick stri strictly to citrus, peaches, and pears. But again, water quality is a part of that equation that helps us to successfully cultivate these plants. Make sure you have adequate soil drainage. Now, I've already told you in Galveston County, we do have an issue with uh, higher clay content, soils that will get sat, uh, easily, more readily saturated, depending on how much rainfall there is and what kind of activity we have on that property. You know, if we get more compaction in that soil. So take a soil test. Soil test is not going to give you an idea of texture. What we're doing with a soil test is trying to get a foundation of information of nutrient availability for those trees. So again, I'll emphasize that when you're taking or when you're sending in a sample to have a soil test committed, you're looking at um, nutrient availability, not texture. There is a test that you can commit through the soil, water, and forage testing lab at Texas A&M University uh, to, to try to figure out what the texture of your soil is, but primarily what we're doing when we send in a soil sample, we're trying to find a foundation of nutrient availability that's already in the soil. All right. But again, make sure you've got adequate drainage for those plants, and that may mean building up a row or a berm or sometimes even a raised bed for those fruiting trees. Air circulation, we take care of that through spacing as well as pr annual pruning. I've got a little note up here for spacing, and again, it depends on the tree that you have. Right? I'm, I'm going to emphasize this part again. We're not going to be talking about pecans. They're different. In general, for fruiting trees like pears, peaches, figs, citrus, it really depends on the variety that they are. Minimum, you know, you, you don't want to get them closer than 10 feet, certainly apart, 18 feet to 30 feet apart, depending on how broad those trees can get. If you're planting in your yard, Give it some space away from your house so you don't have issues either with the structure itself or with the tree that you're cultivating. I should modify this note that I have on this slide. It said I've got it here from eight to 10 feet away from structures, and that's at minimum, folks. So I'm suggesting you get a tree, a fruit tree that you're cultivating, maybe about 15 feet away from the house. But again, keep an eye on where the water is so that you can efficiently get consistent water to those plant to those plants. You may have seen this before, but I'd, I love to repeat it. I like this quote from Dr. Jim Camus, the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension fruit specialist. When you're working with fruit trees, site selection is very important. Consider it like a marriage. It is a long term commitment. When you put that plant in the ground, when you get that peach tree, that pear tree or that citrus tree that you're putting in the ground, that's its forever home. And that's a long term commitment. So make sure that you're you identify the right place for that tree so that you will have less trouble as you proceed forward in cultivating that. Now, one of the things that I did mention is soil drainage. Um, one quick test that you can do, we call it in our trade. I've, I've heard it uh, the, the term bandied about perk test P E R C. Uh, I've had colleagues that'll say, I'm going to take a perk test or tell a resident I to do a perk test. A perk, perk test is short for percolation. And it's, a, it's an easy method that you can do to make sure that the site that you're going to be, pl going to be planting your fruit tree has adequate drainage from the get-go. If it doesn't, you can modify that spot, right? You can build up soil into a berm, or you can find another place that ha that is a higher point has that has adequate drainage in your on your property. Method to do this, take a shovel. Shovels about one foot wide, you know, a blunt um, blunt uh, nosed shovel like the one in the image that I have on this slide. They're about one foot wide. And um, the hilt, the, the shovel length is almost about two feet deep. So literally, you know, you could dig dig down um, dig a hole with just just that but make sure that you get some depth to that hole right it's important because those roots are going to be cruising through the soil profile at a depth two feet and, and more so you're going to want to know that you've got at least good drainage down to two feet i would suggest even more 
So just dig a hole, fill the hole with water, let it sit, sit overnight so it'll give you a more accurate reading the next day. Next day, refill the hole with water and then measure the drainage every hour or every couple of hours. If water is sitting in that hole for four hours, you might want to find another place to, to plant that in the ground. All right, folks. Uh, what I'm providing to you all is a general overview, site selection, as well as a little bit about fertilization. If you're not familiar with fertilizers, some of us are more experienced than others. Um, I, but again, redundancy is my best teacher, so it's always good to go through um, the basics of what fertilizer is when you're looking at a bag of fertilizer, what those numbers mean and how they relate to nutrients in that, in that product. Three numbers that you're presented with. Now, my colleagues can probably attest to this as well. I've been noticing that when I go into a, um, a convenience store, not a convenience store, but a, a, a nursery or a whole a retail outlet, um, we call them box stores, right? If you go to the local uh, home goods store, um, I will see fertilizer that now has branding and not so much the numbers up front on that product. Um, uh, that's a little disappointing to me. I, I went to college to learn this information and, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess the, the short end of this is folks, um, always look for these three numbers, find out what nutrients are available and what percentage they are in that product. So branding is, you know, branding is branding. It can guide you in the right way or guide you in the wrong way. So I'd say to be an educated consumer, look for those three numbers. They relate to the amount of the percentage of nitrogen. The first number is nitrogen. The second number is the amount of phosphorus, percentage of phosphorus in that product. The third number is related to potassium. So nitrogen assists with vegetative growth, focusing on roots and leaves. Oftentimes when we're applying a product, a fertilizer to fruit trees, we're getting a product that is, has a higher percentage of nitrogen in that product. Phosphorus, in essence, as a general rule of thumb, you know, it's focusing on, on flowering. Um, in our soil profiles, typically, if you get a soil test, you'll find that you'll have either a balanced or, or just a, a little bit higher than average phosphorus content. Phosphorus is an immobile nutrient in the soil. And so we don't want to be applying uh, a higher number of phosphorus to, an, to a, a planting environment where we already have an issue with higher levels of phosphorus in it. Uh, potassium is more related to metabolic function. And oftentimes, you know, you'll get a low to no application rate of that product. There are other nutrients that um, are uh, that you may, may see a deficiency on or you may not have uh, adequate availability of it in your soil profile. Iron is one of those. There are others certainly, but we focus on nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium with fertilizer that we do get. I put a little note uh, related to pecans. Zinc is not really related to the kind of fruit cultivation that, we, that we're talking about today. It is more related to pecans, but that's just using that as an example of a nutrient that is um, oftentimes not available in pecan production. So how to, how to understand how to fertilize these trees? You know, there's a general rule of thumb that we can work with as far as ratios or um, application rates. But the bottom line is you, we do recommend that you commit a soil test to get a good idea of what nutrients are available and will help to guide you on how to fertilize those trees as you move forward. And you can do that. You can get forms. You can get instruction for how to submit those uh, tests. You can do it yourself at home, or you can come into an extension office, your local extension office, we have forms, we have um, 
these cute little brown bags that will send it to the right place and we can provide some guidance as well you know so rely on us as agents or our volunteers we'd be more than happy to help you out but online at soiltesting.tamu.edu this is a general caveat that i have on this uh, slide right here if you're planting a new tree you know if it's a citrus tree for instance you're going to get a bead on on a total number a total amount of fertilizer that you're going to apply to that citrus but a general caveat is you know you apply it the first uh first time that you're instructed to apply it you might see some growth off of that um you may not if it comes around time of the that time of the year to apply a second application for that citrus plant and you see no activity it's not going to hurt the plant if you apply the third amount out of that total amount to that citrus at the appropriate time the plant can't use it so if you're not seeing growth on that plant by the second interval of of application you might as well just lay off of um, fertilization or maybe apply a, a lower ratio uh, and that's what i'm that's what i'm talking about here um, fertilize if you've got eight to ten inches of growth by may Spread one cup of a high nitrogen fertilizer like ammonium sulfate. Ammonium sulfate is 2100, uh, about 18 inches from the tree. All right. Folks, before I, oh, oh, and one other technical part that I want to get to as well, and this does relate to fruiting trees. Pears, peaches, plums, not so much figs. Uh, no, not really citrus for us along the Gulf Coast, but we focus on chill hours for uh, plants like peaches and pears, and I'll explain that in a little bit, but I wanted to introduce you to the concept before we continue. Fruiting trees like pears, they need a certain, a certain varieties need a longer dormancy period or higher chill hour for that variety to be productive for that next year. And a chill hour is a is a it's a cumulative tool that we use. What we're doing is we're accumulating, we're measuring the the temperature between 32 to 45 degrees over a period of time. Usually that's from November the 1st to about November the 1st of the current year to February the 28th of the next year. This is a, a period of dormancy that initiates blooming for fruit bearing trees. And it's important for you all to understand that. In Galveston County, because we're landlocked, part of our county is landlocked, we have uh, in Pearland, for instance, you know, we could pull in a, a peach tree that is rated at 400 chill hours, but certainly it, wouldn't, it may not be appropriate if you live on the island where on average, you know, you may do with a, a certain variety that comes in at 150 chill hours. So we range the we have a, a gamut of, you know, a range of temperatures that fluctuate and it depends on where we are in the county. This is just an example of what I've uh, measured accumulated from November the 1st, 2021 to February the 28th of 2022 in Galveston on the island. We uh, determined that we had 163 chill hours. In Pearland, compared with Pearland, 417 chill hours. So it really depends on where you live in the county. You can get an idea of the chill hours that you've accumulated over the past year from your location by going to this website. Yes, it is called Get Chill Hours! Exclamation point, and the URL is getchill.net. They do have a tool that helps you identify a weather station on that particular site. You'll be instructed to provide a, a weather station identification letters. That's usually that's four letters and they have a link to a, a resource where you can e extract that information, plug that in and then you you um, you request the dates that you're looking at to get an idea either where you're at in the middle of winter or what you've just experienced. All right, folks. Uh, Skip or Kevin, are there any uh, questions that anyone has before we get into the varieties? 
we have been chipping away at them, Stephen. Um, so I don't know that any are uh, basically we had questions about can you grow certain things in containers? What type of soil for containers uh, and then cho choosing varieties of apple? Uh, we've been kind of answering some of those. All right, thank you so much, Skip. All right, well, folks, I'd like to introduce you some of the fruit trees and citrus that you could potentially bring into your county. And again, I'm talking about plants that are going to be fairly, you know, moderate. I guess I would say moderate or on the lower lower side of of chill hour accumulated chill hours to a, a you know a moderate level of chill hours. I'd like to start off with peaches. Everybody loves peaches. You know, when you go to Central Texas, you're on the hunt for for peaches that have been harvested. Um, peaches are are a wonderful plant. They can be a little challenging to cultivate, but I'd say don't give up on peaches, even if you live on the Gulf Coast. Peaches are considered to be an ancient fruit. They're native to Northwest China. Uh, when we're talking in, in our trade, when we're talking about fruit trees, we'll say we'll use the term stone fruit when we're talking about uh, peaches or nectarines or plums. Basically, they have a large seed in the in the center of them. And what's the excuse me? What's the difference between a peach and a nectarine? Does it have a velvet or a smooth skin? There you go. That's how I tell the difference between a peach and a nectarine. There's maybe something more technical than that. A good example, when I first got on in Brazoria County, there is a demonstration garden uh, that the master gardeners in Brazoria County cultivate. Uh, and we lost track of a particular of a name of a tree and I identified it. I said, that's a peach tree. I mean, it looked just like a peach tree. Uh, and it didn't produce fruit for three years. And when it did, we figured out really quickly it was a nectarine because of the fruit that it produced. So. Peaches have fuzz, nectarine are smooth. Uh, oftentimes, these, these plants, because of where they originate from, in general, uh, peaches come in at a higher chill hour than we can accommodate in our respective counties along the Gulf Coast. Oftentimes, you'll see, them, uh, you'll see certain varieties that average at 500 chill hours, folks. It's, we, we don't get that here, so it's better to focus on varieties that come in at a lower accumulated chill hour or has been identified at a lower chill hour appropriate for your area. Uh, another note on peaches, clingstone versus freestone. Clingstone meaning that the pit or the stone, the seed in the center clings to the flesh. Freestone meaning those are varieties where the, the seed uh, readily separates from the flesh on the inside. So some varieties that you might consider for your area. If you're living in an area that is, uh, we do have areas in our county that have higher population of soil nematodes that are that are detrimental to the trees themselves. There are beneficial nematodes and then there are other varieties. There are other species that um, are detrimental to the, to the trees themselves. Peaches are a little bit more susceptible to uh, nematode infestation, especially if you have high populations traditionally in your area. So it's best to work with a tree that has been grafted onto a variety, a rootstock called Nemagard, right? So just keep that in mind, folks, especially if, especially if you're living closer to the coast. I know um, in areas, uh, in sandier soils, uh, we do have issues with, with nematodes and that can be a problematic for us. So when we're getting in peach trees, we want to make sure we know what the top part, right, has been grafted onto a roots of another plant. Um, so some varieties you might consider, uh, like Tropic Snow, there is a client down on the island down in Galveston that uh, he had asked us, what is a variety that I can plant here? You know, we, we, we just don't get that cold, cold of a temperature here on the island. And I recommended, you know, you can do really well with a variety like Tropic Snow. It produces a large fruit, white flesh. Pale skin is a pretty little thing. It's in the upper right-hand corner of this slide. It's rated at about 150 to 200 chill hours. 
and the benefit of a variety like tropic snow, it will produce a fruit that can be ready as early as mid to late May. Which you know that can, that can be an advantage if you're considering putting out different varieties of fruit types or fruit trees. I would recommend to get if it's a peach tree, get a variety that is if, if you have a, a, the space to do this and you want to put out three peach trees, I'd say put out one that's an early producer like Tropic Snow. And again, depending on where you're at and the chill hours that you accumulate in your area, maybe one that produces fruit by about July, like La Feliciana, a large fruit, heavy producer, free stone. Some there's some advantages to that. Of course, when I'm eating a peach, you know, I tend to tend to uh, gravitate more towards free stone stuff, stuff where I don't have to mess with that that seed in the middle. It's rated at about 400 chill hours, so I would feel confident uh, planting that in Pearland or even here. We have a demonstration garden associated with our office as well, where we do have a large orchard and we have several different varieties of peaches that we planted out. Tropic Snow is one of them, La Feliciana. And if you're looking for a late producer, one that's producing about July or August, go for a, a variety like August Pride. Yellow Flesh, rich flavor, comes in at about 300 chill hours. So again, it, it really depends on where you're at and what uh, chill hours, you know, what, what is appropriate for the chill hours that you accumulate in your area. Now, there is a resource where you can find out about either peach varieties, specific pear varieties, or even citrus. And of course, that's our home base, Aggie Horticulture. If you have an opportunity to punch that into your uh, to your browser, you can look up Aggie Horticulture, Google Aggie Horticulture, uh, and you will come up with a direct site to us. And on that resource, there are fact sheets for fruit and nut or vegetable fruit and nut production or vegetables. We have a wealth of information. We would love for you to, to visit our website so that you can find out more specifically about some of these varieties and, and culture of them as well. Now, as far as establishing peaches, and again, we don't have a lot of time and I have to focus on, you know, three, three different types of fruiting trees, right? Peaches, pears, and citrus. Um, you can find out more information about this, but in general, as a general caveat for peach establishment, of course, always prepare your soil. Make sure you get great drainage for peaches. They do need really good drainage for them. So you, you, that may mean planting them on a berm or a little hillock about 12 to 16 inches tall. As far as spacing between rows, you want to get machines between that. So if you have an, an actual orchard, you're going to want to put those at least 24 feet apart in rows. But on the row itself, make sure you get minimum 18 feet between the trees themselves. Again, if you have multiples that you're planting in a row, pay attention to the rootstock, get them in the ground December through March. Always make sure to establish those roots before bud break. And after planting, it's kind of shocking. We've done this in example, um, and the plants are perfectly fine. After you get that plant in the ground, cut the trunk to a single liter. When you buy a plant, a peach tree, plum tree, most fruit trees, right? You get them in winter time at a master gardener plant sale or another nursery. Oftentimes you have beautiful foliage on those trees, but when you get that peach tree home, cut it to a single liter down to about three foot tall, right? Because we're trying to establish an architecture and keeping that tree low enough that we can actually harvest from it. So you're going to do that purposely. After you cut that tree, wrap it with tube or foil to protect that bark from sun scald or critters at about uh, 18 inches. And then as far as watering, this is just a general uh, a snapshot of what you should be looking at as far as watering. Make sure you're getting at least oh, an inch a week as summer increases, as the heat increases, wind starts has a part in all of this can dry out soil as well. You may need to water more especially as the tree is developing. This is a little snapshot of a watering schedule that I borrowed from a fact sheet pr produced by Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. So again, this information you can find from those fact sheets that will help to guide you in establishing your trees. As far as fertilization, 
put down a, a material, I would suggest to either work with a material that comes in at a three, one, two ratio. That could be the numbers that you see on a bag of fertilizer could be 15, five, 10, right? We're looking at a ratio three, one, two, or you could use something like ammonium sulfate. Regardless, once you determine what kind of fertilizer you're putting around that tree, the first year, about a cup, eight to, eight to 10, uh, uh, if you've got about eight to 10 inches of growth by May. So put down about a cup of, once you plant it in the ground and by May, if you've got uh, some growth on it, go ahead and apply about a cup of fertilizer to that. Second year, you're going to increase the number of times that you're going to be applying that material. We estimate three to four times anywhere between March through June, about a cup per application. And again, you're going to increase that ratio as you get into the third year. After that, you know, it is best to keep an eye on, you may not get production for the first three years or four years or maybe even five years, and that's okay. Um, you'll be uh, analyzing that soil as, uh, again, just to make sure that you've got nutrient availability, adequate nutrient availability. You can also take leaf samples and send them into the very same laboratory at Texas A&M University. There are instructions on how to do that. What it does, a leaf, leaf sampling provides you with an idea of how those nutrients are translocating into the canopy, right? How, how those nutrients are cruising through that, through that tree. As far as pruning, we don't have adequate time to cover that. You can find this information out through these fact sheets. But we prune trees to enhance productivity, improve air circulation, increase light, revitalize the tree. Um, and for peach trees, you know, you want to wait until after they produce those start, they, they start to, the buds start to swell, flower buds start to swell. That's when you're targeting pruning. And you can also prune again. We're going to have a workshop here in Galveston County on uh, summer pruning fruit trees in a couple of weeks on a Saturday. Those are free programs. We encourage you to look on our, uh, our organization's website, uh, galveston.agrilife.org, and then um, you can find out how, where those workshops are being given, what time, of, what time they are, how to register for it. But we do prune in summer. We've got another shot for pruning uh, peach trees in early summer um, to enhance, keep that architecture going and enhance for next year's growth and production. As far as thinning, this is just a general caveat. It controls the number of fruits. So just because your peach tree, plum, tr uh, not plums, but peach tree, pear tree, um, produces a number of fruits, you're going to want to enhance the, the individual fruit. And you do that by lessening the, um, the resources that the plant is using to send out to all of those fruits as they develop. So you're going to want to thin those uh, fruits as they're starting to set. We're a little bit beyond that uh, that window. You want to get to these fruits when they're about a little bit about the size of a quarter or maybe less, and you're going to want to thin them at least a good six to eight inches apart. It can be a little disheartening if you think I'm I'm destroying all my all my production, but our goal is to increase the size of the individual fruit, and that's the importance of thinning these fruits as you go along. Pears, they're another ancient fruit. They're, they're native to Europe and Asia. We consider them to be pom fruits, right? Stone fruits are peaches, nectarines, plums. Pom fruits are apples and pears. Uh, the, the European pear is specifically what we focus on, what we tend to cultivate. Those are pear-shaped, there are many different hybrids, and I'll show you the varieties that you can work with. The Asian pears are more apple shaped, and they they have a texture more like an apple. On average, they can grow in temperate uh, temperate climates, averaging 500 chill hours. But again, we're working with varieties that are appropriate for our area. As far as fertilizing them, there is a specific method for fertilizing them, folks. We are recording this video and it will be available um, for you to review if you'd like to see specific information of what I'm presenting today. But also you can go to these fact sheets uh, that we provide through Aggie Horticulture and get the same information. 
So I'm working with a 3-1-2 ratio. First year, you've got it in the ground, get about a half a cup of whatever fertilizer you're working with, making sure the fertilizer prills don't lean up against the, the bark of that tree. Get them out, up and around the, the uh, drip line of that tree. Increase that the second year, and then again on the third year. Um, oftentimes, you know, I have had colleagues that will say, you know, if you've got a lawn fertilizer with a 3-1-2 ratio, 15-5-10, that will suffice as well. After that second year, if you're cultivating a pear tree in your yard, if you're already fertilizing your lawn, the tree's going to benefit from that. So you may not need a supplemental application after that. The challenge that we have with pears in our high humid area is fire blight. Fire blight, I, I did not prepare an image of what fire blight looks like, but literally it looks like you took, you took a match to a, a stem or a, a branch and it just literally uh, it disrupts the vascular tissue and it makes it look like that that plant has just succumbed to a fire um, so that's the challenge with working with pear trees but you can work with them successfully some of the varieties you might consider there's one variety called acres home fairly you know decent sized fruit itself comes in at about three to three hundred three hundred to three fifty chill hours if you're into canning right? And you really don't have time to be thinning the fruit. You might consider a variety like kefir. Acres Home is, I'm holding up my fingers because I, I work better that way visually. Um, Acres Home is, can fit in the, a one single fruit can fit in the palm of my, my hand, rest comfortably, nest in there. Kefir is a smaller variety. They come in in about, maybe about four inches in diameter. They're really small fruit. They're crisp, they're great for canning. They are fire blight resistant. They are uh, considered to be a, a hybrid between the European and the Asian varieties, and they're fairly low chill, low chill enough for us. Southern Bartlett is a larger fruit. They're, they're delicious. I've had each one of these are in the Brazoria County orchard. Uh, if you have a chance to visit our, our Brazoria County master gardeners, go check out their orchard. They've got some wonderful uh, varieties in that orchard itself. I really like Southern Bartlett as far as a larger fruit. Acres Home works as well. We did have Tennessee out there, but it didn't pr uh, provide us with fruit as often as we would like. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't, you would not be successful. Tennessee is as an as an Asian variety. It is one of those rounded uh, pears. Great flavor and as a great storage for those uh, fruits as well. Well, folks, I want to go ahead and um, uh, we're about 50 minutes into the program today. I thank you for your time. We've got a little bit further to go. I may abbreviate some of the slides that I have because, uh, again, this is a lot of information that I'm providing to you. But, of course, citrus is king. I think it is king and queen for our area. Some of the information you may not know, 2020, 2020 to 2021 commercial growing season, it's estimated that cit commercial citrus production was valued in Texas at around $3 million. And that's a chunk of change, folks. That's a lot of money that comes through our, our state. And a lot of the production in Texas is located in the lower Rio Grande Valley. That's Hidalgo County, county accounting for about 85% of the citrus production. Cameron County, which is close by, and Willacy County, which is on the west, end, west of that region uh, in lower Texas along the border. Across the United States, Texas and Arizona come in at about 2% for production. They're the third largest citrus producing states behind California, 60%, and Florida, 38%. And I got this from the USDA Citrus Fruits 2021 summary. Those summaries are often, you know, about six to eight months behind. So I suspect that um, for 2020, well, we haven't gotten through 2022, folks, so I've gotten you at least some of the information, most recent information as far as commercial production. The reason I'm providing this information to you is to help us to understand how important citrus is as far as a value crop for us, which relates to uh, two diseases that we have seen in our counties. If you live, if you're in, in, in one of these regions, if you're viewing from Corpus or Ranzas County, 
possibly a Fort Bend County, or if you're viewing from Montgomery County, Galveston County, Brazoria County, we are all quarantined for citrus greening. It's a disease caused by a bacterium. Currently, there is an investigation or there is research into resistant varieties, but with no, um, no practical application at this point in time. So it's a disease that that we have to control by movement of plants. So we're quarantined for that in our uh, counties. It does affect the vascular tissue of the plant itself, uh, which affects production. So you've got a, a high value crop for Texas that's meaningful, and now you have two diseases that there's no um, there's no there's no cure for just yet. That can be problematic. Again, quarantine counties include Webb, Jim Hogg to Star County to Cameron County. That, so that's what we consider to be the Valley of Texas, Lower Rear Grand Valley, Kleberg to Calhoun County. And then in our area where I live, Brazoria, Montgomery, Fort Bend, Galveston, and Harris County are all quarantined for citrus greening. If you'd like to know more about this, you can go to a website called Citrus Alert which I think is more user friendly. Texas Department of Agriculture certainly has a wonderful resource uh, regarding these diseases and um, pesticide licensing, et cetera. But as far as citrus info, um, I think the Citrus Alert has a, a little bit better way of explaining that to lay, lay folks. So another, another disease that we have that's affecting us here in our county is citrus canker, disease caused by another bacterium uh, there are various vectors for it. For citrus greening, the vector is a citrus psyllid, a little fly-like insect. But for um, citrus canker, it has different different um, uh, ways that, that your plant can get that. It, is, it does affect the vascular tissue of the plant. So again, the, the, you can help to lessen the impact of that by not by purchasing citrus trees, working with citrus trees, within your county, right? If you have a purchase from a nursery and you live outside of our quarantined area, if you purchase one in a quarantine area, by law, you're not supposed to be moving that to a non-quarantined area. So we can be responsible for minimizing the movement of these two pathogens that there's currently no cure for. Now, as far as putting citrus in your yard, of course, um, keep in mind that citrus is a tropical or temperate plant. Think of them as tropical plants. Some citrus has more sensitivity, their wood has more sensitivity to our climatic conditions. So if you live in Harris County or Montgomery County, which can get colder than it can be in my county, in Galveston County, on certain years, it may limit what I can actually put in the ground. I uh, remember um, that uh, Skip had mentioned that there was a question on container planting, I believe. So you may consider to work with lemons and limes. Instead of putting them in your yard, you may consider cultivating them in containers because citrus wood uh, has a sensitivity to frost. High sensitive plants like lemons and limes can be problematic if you've got them in the ground and you get a hard freeze. Medium sensitivity, we say sweet oranges and grapefruits, so you might get away with uh, putting grapefruit in your yard. I certainly have. I've got a grapefruit uh, in my backyard called Cocktail and it's doing just fine. It even made it through uh, Winter Storm Uri. I covered it. That's a story for another time. The most cold hardy citrus that we can uh, cultivate are tangerines and mandarins. So even though we know that fruit can handle it colder, I would say focus on the plant. You can always cultivate fruit the next year, but you may not have the you may not be able to buy a particular variety of wood if you lose that, you know, a plant if you lose that in a in a really hard year. I got this information from U University of California Davis. They've got a great um, document that does talk about this kind of research and sensitivity of citrus plants. So basics on these guys, back to the basics. They all require full sun and great drainage. If you don't have that, you might consider creating an environment where you can do that. Oftentimes we're looking at fruit that begins to mature around October. 
Um, the benefit of having citrus trees, some like grapefruit, some varieties of grapefruit and oranges can hang on the tree sometimes all the way up into February. Keep in mind the larger trees like navel oranges and grapefruits, you may want to actually cultivate those in the ground because they can get really large. That can be difficult to, to work with in containers. Now you can cultivate them in containers, but I would uh, say keep that in mind. You know, you can work with mandarins in containers. Mandarins, satsumas are a, mand a variety of mandarin orange. You know, uh, tangerines, you can you can work with those in a container, but I'd suggest to you to work with navel oranges and grapefruits in ground. Lemons and limes, uh, I did plant a lemon tree in my backyard. It's a variety called Ujukitsu. So I'm kind of, um, I'm toying with the elements, but um, uh, you know, it, it really depends on that, as well as the kind of rootstock that you're working with regarding container or in ground. That that involves a whole nother presentation, folks. So we're gonna focus just on plants in ground, and at least you get an idea of wood sensitivity regarding citrus to, fr to freezes or cold temperatures as well as um, average height for these plants and how you'll be working with them. Now, I, I love grapefruit. It took me a while to learn to love grapefruit, but I really do like it. It's taken me a while. Uh, it's, it's a great uh, uh, plant to work with. Grapefruit is thought to be not naturally occurring. So there are five different, um, ancient, five different citrus types that are considered to be ancient fruits. Right, that other that more modern plants have been uh, developed for our enjoyment and um, and benefit. Grapefruit is cons is uh, also called the forbidden fruit of the Barbados. It was found as a sport is thought it to be a cross between an orange and a, an ancient fruit called a pomelo. Right, it's just this sport that that occurred and and was discovered sometime around 1750. Now Texas has a long history, over 100 years uh, history of grapefruit production, mostly focused in the valley. Um, and we do a uh, well quite with it, and uh, that's a, a lot of what is produced and exported from our uh, our great state, of course, is grapefruit. Now in your area, again, you can, um, right now I have a grapefruit that just got through blooming, and my job is to keep that, that fruit uh, expanding, keep the fruit developing by consistent watering for that plant, adequate fertilization to keep the plant healthy, trying to get that fruit to expand, I might actually get, uh, be able to cull that fruit or, or pull it onto my table by November. But certainly my cocktail, um, grapefruit variety cocktail, you know, I, I have the luxury of leaving it on the tree for a little bit of time. But different varieties you can work with. If you like the red varieties, I love the uh, acidity of ruby red as well as Rio red. Ruby red has been cultivated since 1929, folks. Ha it's been quite successful. It's, it's put us on the map as far as a uh, variety that that um, that is commercially successful for us here in uh, Texas. And it is known to be uh, hardy to the low 20s if it's uh, if it's grafted onto a, a rootstock or another vari variety of another species of citrus called the trifoliate orange. Uh, Rio Red, another uh, sweet variety as well. I, I like that one. It's, it's a little bit lower acidic than Ruby Red, but I, I prefer either one as far as reds. Or you might prefer less acidic varieties like Oro Blanco, white flesh, very low acid, thick rind on it, but it is seedless. If you go for a variety like Golden, I've got this up here for your information. I tend to like my grapefruit with a little bit of bite to it. Golden is almost like a, a, a I compare it to an, an orange on steroids, you know, so it, it doesn't have a lot of the flavor that I expect from a grapefruit. But certainly if you have issues with acidity in citrus and grapefruit, you might consider one like Golden. But keep in mind, it's a good squeezer because it's very juicy and it's got a lot of seeds on it. So you're not going to be putting that on the table, um, breakfast table. Cocktail, I like that one. It's it's a little bit milder, but Bloom Sweet work just works just as well. As far as oranges, if you're going for navel oranges, there's a there is quite a variety of of oranges that you can be successful at. You know, depending on where you are 
in Texas. Valencia is the most common. There is a variety that has, it does have the name of N33. Large fruit. I want to say that's at least a good six to eight inches in diameter of a, of a fruit of an orange. Very, very delicious. I've had that and I actually prefer that over Valencia. Um, Cara Cara, that's an image that I took. Uh, I took uh, some uh, fruit, cut it up on my chopping block. It took some pictures. Cara Cara, while it does have a little bit of a redder meat to it, um, it has a very mild taste as far as an orange goes. So again, if that's your preference, I'd say cultivate it. Uh, for me, you know, not so much. Other varieties, I do love the blood oranges like Moro blood. It's very acidic, but it's bold, and I really like that. For the blood oranges, it's really cool. You can take them, squeeze them. You can do this with any citrus, squeeze out the juice, get an empty ice, ice cube tray, and put those, you know, line the uh, trays with that juice, and you've got a wonderful, a wonderful talking point for your next cocktail party. <laughs> Combine it with your adult beverages if you like. I really uh, dig uh, Moro blood ice cubes uh, that I've harvested. They're good for at least five to six months in your in your freezer. Um, and uh, I like it with Sprite. It makes a nice little refreshing drink. Taraco blood. I've got some that I'm cultivating now in my backyard. So I'll let y'all know, folks, how that actually um, how that uh, my success with that at a later time. Republic of Texas, I mentioned that one as far as a navel orange because it is known to be the most cold hardy of the citrus. It was discovered in Angleton in 1847. So uh, I'd suggest that if you have, uh, if you live in a county that does get colder uh, t a time of year, you might consider a variety like, like uh, Republic of Texas. As far as the mandarins go, again, satsumas are mandarin oranges. Tangerines are considered to be mandarin oranges. Think of mandarin oranges as zip skin fruits, right? The, the skin comes off easily. Because they, they, you can remove the skin quite readily, oftentimes when you're cultivating that, you're going to want to cut off a bit of the stem. If you try to pull that off the tree when it's ripe, you are going to get skin that comes with it. So you're either going to eat that fruit right then and there, or you're going to figure out a way to, to store it. You're going to get a dried fruit later on. So oftentimes when you're cultivating mandarins or satsumas, remember they have a very thin skin to them that does peel readily. You're going to want to cut that off of the st at the stem side rather than try to pluck it off the tree itself. Some mandarin varieties, one that I really prefer you might try a variety called Kishu. I like Kishu because it's seedless and it, it produces, uh, when it's in good production, two to three inch fruits that are very mild. They're delicious, especially if you refrigerate them when they're ripe. They're, they're just outstanding, but there are other varieties you can work with as well. Larger citrus, right? Still thin skin. Satsumas like Brown Select has a very nice flavor to it. Uh, see, it's also seedless. Frost Owari, you can try that. It does have a delicate taste to it, but it does produce a few seeds in it. I've got Miho in a container um, that is not ready for cultivation yet, but I'm going to cultivate that over time. It'll take me a couple of years, and two years from now, I'll let you know how I'm doing with that one. You could also try different varieties of tangerine. I've not experimented with tangerine, but from the literature that I've read, Dancy is one of those that you could work with if you decide on a smaller fruit. Lemons and limes, you can get production at variable times. So grapefruits, you pretty much, you know, you've got flowering, you'll get fruit set, and you've got one harvest at the end of the year. Lemons and lime will repeat bloom throughout the year, and the advantage to that is you can continue to harvest lemons and limes throughout the year. Some varieties you might consider, Lisbon, Lisbon has an actual lemon flavor to it. I know folks love Meyer improved lemon or Meyer lemons and they just, you know, brag on them and you can get great production off of, of, of a Meyer lemon. But I think it pales in comparison to the actual lemon flavor that you can get from a variety like Lisbon or Ponderosa. So keep that in mind, folks. Meyer lemon is, is more of a sweet, milder lemon taste. 
I've experimented. I've got Uchikitsu in the ground. It survived Winter Storm Yuri because I covered that wood, right? I actually made it. I got it to come back, right? It's the good graces of a higher power that got that got that plant to come back because Stephen did as much as he could, and then it was up to the elements after that. And um, but my Uchikitsu, I planted in the ground months prior to Winter Storm Yuri. It's now coming back as far as its architecture, but I don't anticipate getting production off of that tree for at least another year or two. It set it back a little bit, but it's considered to be lemonade on a tree. It's so high in, in sugar content that when it's ripe, you can literally squeeze that the juice out of that fruit and drink it straight. Low acidity. So I'll let you all know how I work with that one. I do have three two different no three different varieties of limes in containers on my back porch persian lime is an outstanding larger fruit i also have a mexican or a key lime thornless variety in the back as well they produce lots of fruit but very very small so it really depends on what you're envisioning as far as what you'd like would you like a larger lime go for a persian lime or maybe lots of smaller limes, then I'd say go for a Mexican or a key lime. Now, as far as citrus fertilization, a general rule of thumb or peaches at a certain time of uh, its development, you know, maybe about the third year on peaches, you'll be, second or third year, you'll be applying a fertilizer split into three or four applications throughout a season. On citrus, we take the total amount of, of fertilizer that we're going to apply to, to that individual plant and we break it up into three applications. So this is just a chart showing you differences in, in fertili fertiliz fertilizer ratios. You would be applying an amount based on the nitrogen content of that bag of fertilizer depending on its ratio, right? So that's all that is. Balanced fertilizer by 13, 13, 13, maybe the first year you're applying a total of one and a half pounds split into three applications. So I'll repeat myself. The fertilizer that you're applying depends on its ratio that you've determined from a soil test, right? You can use a 19.10.5, but you're only gonna be applying about during that first year, one pound of fertilizer broken up into three applications, February, late April, and mid-June. As a general rule of thumb, we say Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, and Father's Day. It's easy to remember, folks. So in my case, I'm using a, a balanced fertilizer. I'm already in the second year of production on these plants, so I'm going to apply one pound. I've already applied one pound of the product. In February, right now it's time to apply one pound around that individual tree. And then again, around Father's Day, that last pound of application. Remember what I said earlier, folks, if you're not seeing uh, an effect from the fertilizer that you've applied to that individual tree, if you're not seeing growth by that second application, there's no reason to apply that third application to citrus. If the plant's not utilizing the nutrients, you know, don't waste your time and money on applying that last pound. You can put it out. It's not going to hurt the tree. The tree just may not be able to utilize it. And just just a little rule of thumb for you as far as guidance goes. Now, as far as watering goes, it is critical. You want to get uh, make sure you get consistent water to those plants, whether you're hand watering it or whether you have it through a drip system. Um, pre bloom through May. Now, around March through May, one inch a week. Increase that as you get into summer, as the, heat, as it's, the, heat, as the uh, heat starts becoming a little bit more oppressive. June through August, one and a half inches. Back it off September through November. And then depending on right around September all the way through February, it really depends on those rain events that we get, the seasonal rains. I took this picture on the lower left-hand side. These are all my images, by the way, but the one on the lower left-hand side, I took that of my Persian lime three days ago. And so I want those, treat, those fruit to continue to develop and expand, so I'm going to provide 
make sure that I get adequate water to that, consistent water to that plant so that I will get the fruit that I expect out of it. Well, everyone, I thank you so much for joining me this morning. I'm so happy to be able to provide some of my expertise to you. I'm very grateful to our colleagues, uh, Kevin, Kevin Gibbs, as well as Skip Richter for providing assistance and answering questions. These are some resources that you can go to that are available to you. Again, you can view this video again uh, to find out some of these resources. South Texas Citrus Alert, um, Texas A&M Horticulture. I've got those listed, but if you go to Aggie Horticulture, you can find these resources from our website. Texas A&M University Kingsville Citrus Center. They are the, uh, they have been, uh, they are the uh, resources providing research into cultivation of citrus as well as as um, research for for um, a, li a little they, they are our primary institute providing research for research for citrus in Texas. They are also the place to get budwood. They are, they've been uh, given the, um, the the license and the pleasure to be able to sell budwood to you clean wood to make sure that you're cultivating citrus responsibly if you're grafting citrus texas a&m soil water and forage testing lab soil testing.tamu.edu there are other resources that you can go to as well florida extension has wonderful resources that are available and appropriate for our use as well remember texas a&m agri-life horticulture aggie horticulture is our texas centric source of information but you can also borrow appropriate and applicable information from UC Davis, as well as California Stone Fruit Research Database. So folks, are there, um, Skip or Kevin, are there any questions that anyone has? Stephen, uh, someone asked about, could you cover persimmons? Maybe say a few words about persimmons. I know there's a great persimmon publication on the Aggie Horticulture website you mentioned, and by the way, I did post that into the chat, folks, if you want to scroll up and have a link to that. Well, persimmons, I, I haven't had too many issues cultivating persimmons. Um, we did have one in in the um, orchard in Brazoria County. We're not cultivating any here in uh, our in our county, in Galveston County. Um, as far as uh, gosh, as far as cultivating them, I, I would say you know you could you can be very successful with persimmons uh, there is a variety called fuyu uh, non-astringent varieties that i would uh, suggest that you do cultivate um gosh i can't think of of anything to add other than i've i've had uh, a lot of success we've had a lot of success with pears we've been able to um be very lucky and not have fire blight you know on the trees that we've had persimmons i'm not aware of too many diseases that they're susceptible to the challenge with uh, persimmons is battling the critters for the fruit. Oftentimes we've had a, a glorious um, production on the tree that we the, uh, the variety that we had down in Brazoria County. And when we were ready to harvest, they all just disappeared and we know it was it was animals, the critters getting all the fruit. But um, I've had a lot of success. Um, we've had a lot of success with that particular fruit tree. So I'd suggest if you're going for a, a variety, go for a non non astringent variety. They all will pucker you up if you, you know, pucker your mouth if you uh, if you uh, get them when they're not ripe. So I'd, I'd suggest to go for the uh, non-astringent varieties if you can. All right, Carol uh, has her hand up. Carol, if you want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Hey, Carol. If you're talking, Carol, we can't hear you, so check the... Quite all right. Well, Carol, thank you for joining us today. Um, we'll be online just for a little bit longer. Just a shout out again to future programs that we have for gardening in the Gulf Coast. Of course, today was fruit trees and citrus trees revisited. We've got a we've got a wonderful a group of uh, horticulture colleagues that will be providing a roundtable opportunity for us on June the first, I believe it is. Uh, hopefully, I didn't get that date wrong. Um, 
as well as uh, July, Vegetables for Summer Heat with Skip Richter. Well, folks, if there are no other questions, then um, check the chat here. I think we may have one. Uh, just some thank yous. <laughs> I love praise, so thank you. And thank you. Thank you all for your time this morning. It's always a pleasure to deliver these programs to you. Remember, don't forget uh, that extension is here as a service to our community. Please utilize. I think we're all talking to the choir folks, so uh, please utilize uh, our offices. No matter what your interest is, if it's in coastal marine resources, certainly we have agents uh, stationed at uh, certain counties. Ag and natural resources, we have some very talented uh, folks that are working with us in pasture management, if that's your interest. Nutrition programs, family and community health. But us horticulturists, you know, there's very few and far between uh, of us. We're very blessed to be able to have as many horticulture agents in our um, metropolitan area around Houston. But we're very, I'm very thankful that we've got uh, Kevin Gibbs down uh, along the coast. Kevin's in, are you in Aransas County, Kevin? Nueces. Nueces. Uh, Ginger Easton Smith, even uh, her title is Ag and Natural Resources, but she's an outstanding horticulturist as well, and she's in Aransas. That's correct. Excellent. Well, folks, again, thank you all for your time this morning. We'll see you next month with a roundtable with our colleagues in, in uh, Aggie Horticulture. Um, we're very, we're, we look forward to that program with you. Uh, I will send out, uh, we, we have been collecting names, so I will send out a survey to help keep us on track to make sure that we're providing and delivering a uh, product that is meaningful to you, uh, programs that are meaningful to you. So look for an email with a link to the uh, recording as well as a survey that we ask that you participate in. So until then, uh, see you next I'm, month. I'm going to jump in real quick here, uh, Stephen, and put in a shameless plug for another project that the four of us are working on, and that is a school gardening conference coming up this summer. If any of you know teachers, that would be homeschool, private school, or public school, that would be interested in a uh, very low cost all day conference with lots of great speakers. Uh, be watching for that. It, it's also on Eventbrite and we'll be promoting it more as the days go forward. But please put the word out to any speakers you know. Yes, please. We're, we're hard at work and we're, we're really looking forward to providing that program to you. I'm going to do something really quick to enhance that. Let's see if I can do this. No, I can't do it. Oh well, there you go. Nope. All right, Cultivating School Gardens Conference, Wednesday, July the 20th. Please uh, browse online to Eventbrite, register, tell your friends to, in education, educating youth. We would love to have you. It'll be a great program. We're really looking forward to it as well. So thank you for mentioning that, Skip. All right, folks. See y'all later. Those are pecans. Thanks, Dave. Oh, thank you, Kevin. Have and a thank good you. One. Yes, sir.